What is up, weather enthusiasts? I'm your host, Pat's Path Predictor. Let's get right into the weather. All right, so here's the situation we have for you, ladies and gentlemen. This is going to be another one of our tropical videos today. I'm going to be talking about kind of when I expect tropical activity to ramp up for each region of the Atlantic Ocean, as well as that, that kind of stuff. But before we get into that, I want to go ahead and actually highlight something that's been go uh, going on uh, that I've been kind of paying attention to over the last couple of days with the Storm Prediction Center for severe weather in areas in the Midwest, because I know I've been getting some requests to, rec uh, to cover this eventually, so that's what I'm going to end up doing. So here's the situation that we have going on. This is what I'm paying attention to. I was messaging with Gabe about it earlier this morning, and we were kind of talking about this risk a little bit. So here's the situation that we have right here, and let me go ahead and move this over so that way you guys have a visual. We have a 30% risk of severe weather right here for parts of Iowa, Missouri, and Illinois over here, and a 15% from the Oklahoma-Texas border all the way to near Green Bay, Wisconsin, which this both of these risks compose of, of a population of around 30 million people. So we'll have to pay very close attention to this right here. So let's go ahead and see what we're potentially looking at. Medium range guidance has been fairly consistent in the past several cycles showing a negatively tilted trough, which is really good for severe weather, uh, moving through on Tuesday. As this occurs, a surface low will deepen and track uh, northeast to Minnesota and Wisconsin. As this occurs, the cold front will develop east of the region, and that we'll see um, mid uh, to upper 60s dew points across the warm sector, and it'll be very widespread, adding to moderate to strong destabilization during the day. That's likely going to enhance our Cape values and cause some some more some more severe weather. If you've been watching my documentaries, you uh, you kind of understand what I'm talking about. For those, but for those who don't, the more Cape you have, the more instability you have. But if you have a, la a layer of stable air below that, which is the cap, that means that there's a loaded gun scenario. So that's just kind of the gist of it. If you want more details, check out the documentaries I've been making. So that's what we have going on. Here's the situation we uh, have going uh, right here. Storms will likely develop by the early afternoon near the surface load and cold front across western Iowa and southward into eastern Kansas. The current expectation is that a linear MCS will evolve over Iowa, Missouri, and shift east through the evening. While damaging gusts will be the primary hazard, a large hail and tornadoes will also be possible. So that's kind of what we have, and this is looking like it's going to be an all-around risk day right here. So that's kind of the situation that we are kind of looking at as we continue to uh, take a look at the severe weather hazards of this. So with that being out of the way, we're going to go ahead and talk tropics now because I'm sure a lot of the people who have clicked on this video are like, Patrick, you're, you clickbaited us. You're talking about severe weather, but we want to know about the tropics. What are you doing? Well, here's the thing. I just wanted to briefly go over that since I've been getting some requests. Now I'm, do now I'm done with the severe weather. Let's go ahead and move right into the tropics right here. So here's what we have going on right here. Essentially, how I want to approach, approach this is I want to look at some of the conditions again, as well as to look at some of the models uh, indicating what the warm, what the water is going to be like, what the shear is going to be like, kind of like what also what the ENSO cycle is going to be like, as well as a bunch of other stuff that we're looking at, such as dry air and all that stuff. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into it right now. Let's go ahead and t first take a look at the global sea temperatures as of right now. Very warm across the main development region and especially warm in the Caribbean Sea. I've been highlighting it in the last couple of tropical videos that I've been making. And I know Weather Center Nazario has been talking about this as well. But we didn't have any hurricanes move into the Caribbean last year and cool off these warm waters. And considering that it's right now May 18th and we are seeing this warm... Uh, amount of warm water right now which is already off to a good start and if there are if there are the few of a few other factors were to be or to align we'd see a uh, good conditions for hurricane development just based on the water temperatures alone but that's not the reason it hasn't yet is because of wind shear and dry air which we'll get to in just a second but another thing i'm noticing is we're starting to see a lot more 30 plus degrees celsius or 86 plus degree fahrenheit areas in the Caribbean Sea as well as in parts of the Gulf of Mexico starting around the Bay of Campeche over here starting to form and considering that it's May 18th right now it's yeah that's a little concerning to take a look at as well as this huge blob of 30 plus degrees Celsius over here in this whole region 
in the main development region that is well over the threshold for hurricane development. That's something to pay very close attention to. Florida Keys is also getting up there, but because it's a more of a shallow uh, section of Florida uh, coast over there, I'm not too concerned about that right now. So with that being said, we have the waters for it right here. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the wind shear. So here's the wind shear that we have as of today right here. Let's go ahead and zoom back in on this. We are going to be seeing some fluctuations of wind shear. We are seeing about 25 to 30 knots of wind shear across, uh, the, across parts of the Caribbean right now. But that's expected to fluctuate, especially as we go into June and all that stuff. We are seeing a lot of wind shear going on over here in the western half of the main development region. Eastern parts of the MDR as well as the ITCZ is going to see less wind shear, at least for now. So that's kind of the wind shear map I'm taking a look at. This is why you're not getting hurricanes in May, ladies and gentlemen. This layer of, of deep layer shear right here, no pun intended, is what's really uh, holding it back right here. If the wind shear was like down to like 20 knots, down to 15 knots, then we could start talking about that. But then we'd have to put into consideration the Sahara dust, which is going to be a contributing factor this year, although we don't know to what degree because of just how crazy these scales are going to be at this current point. So let's go ahead and uh, pull up some model runs right here. We're going to go ahead and use the CFS weekly to kind of give a more short-term, I say short-term forecast, but, because, but this does go out six weeks. But... Anyway, that's kind of besides the point. Here's what we have going on. This is for May 25th. Yeah, we're still going to be seeing a large amount of wind shear this early. Uh, this isn't even hurricane season yet, but I'm still highlighting it. Then we start to see a more of, around, uh, of an around average situation as we go, start to go into the, the first weeks of June right here. We start to see around average uh, wind shear going on. So I'm not necessarily too concerned, at least for areas down like Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Puerto Rico for the month of June right here. And this is what we have by June 29th. We are seeing around average wind shear. And based off of what I'm seeing right here, as well as the warm waters, let's go ahead and show you those uh, those those anomalies that we're pay paying attention to right here. Unfortunately, we can't do it with this model. We can see if the CANSIPS can do that. Just here's the SST anomaly. Perfect. This is what we have for June going in right here. We're looking at SST anomalies possibly uh, cracking 2.5 degrees Celsius above average in parts of the Caribbean Sea. And considering what we're looking at, as well as the latest uh, sea temperature right now across parts of the Atlantic Ocean, this is the whole Atlantic Ocean, what we're seeing right here, easily above average. And we're right now outperforming what we were seeing last year with the record warm sea surface temperatures. That's why the El Nino didn't do much to the hurricane activity. And the only thing it did was call, uh, was weaken the uh, the Bermuda high enough to stop, uh, to stop any more landfalls from approaching the United States. It still produced 20 named storms at the, at this current, but at this current point, we're looking at a, an even warmer SST record for 2024 than we were in 2023. Which, coupled with the La Nina, uh, Nina forecast coming uh, coming in with both Nino indexes, the uh, Nino one uh, the region one and two, which is off the coast of Peru, has been really crazy to say the very least. This one has been more around average. It's been kind of a holding like this because of uh of the re of the region four. We can go ahead and show you that. Right here, this is what we're looking at. It's still holding pretty stable, steadily, but steadily decreasing at the same time. So something to pay attention to as we continue to uh, talk about this. So yeah, we're looking at this right here. So the timeline I would I would give for this stuff to start organizing and developing for the month of June. Uh, for the month of June, I would say for the greatest threat this year is going to be around the Lesser Antilles as well as areas in the Eastern Caribbean. Uh, like I, uh, and everything like that. This is primarily due to the fact that we see this every year. This is going to be a situation where we're going. Uh, it's going to be a typical area of of tropical cyclone impacts. However, I could see a possibility where we could see more tropical cyclones in June than usual. I'm not saying it's going to be 2020 levels or anything like that, but I honestly can't rule out three, four possibly even five tropical cyclones for the month of June, primarily due to the fact that we're seeing a, a decrease in the wind shear, as well as the fact that for at least what we're looking at right here, we can go ahead and show you that right here with the precip anomalies. It's going to be very moist across the intertropical convergence zone, abnormal, uh, abnormally uh, moist right here, as well as in parts of the Caribbean over here. Yeah, I can't really rule that out, but I still... 
at the same time, though, th- I still at the same time, though, ha- have to pay attention to the wind shear as well as this, the Sahara dust right there. And this is why I'm saying there could be possibly five named systems for the month of June, because at this point, you're seeing warm water, you're seeing maybe a little weaker wind shear because the transition from El Nino to La Nina. Now the main question is, what is the Sahara dust going to do at that point? So that's that's another thing I'm paying attention to. Now for the month of July, as you're seeing right here, that's when I start to open up for the rest of the Caribbean Sea as well as parts of the Bahamas and maybe into Florida a little bit right there, at least southern Florida, at least for maybe like a tropical storm or something to make landfall. The conditions aren't quite there yet for a hurricane or anything like that, but I do think maybe a tropical storm or something like that could uh, encroach and could um, cause some uh, some tropical storm conditions as uh, conditions as we continue to see the warmer sea surface temperatures, the transition fully to La Nina, as well as the, uh, just a massive amount of moisture anticipated for much of the area right here. So that's what we have going on for pretty much the month of uh, month of July, and then August and September right here. At least for August, that's when I would open up the Gulf of Mexico for possible impacts because at that point the wind shear in the Gulf is starts to really co- uh, collapse and calm down, and that's expected to continue through much of this uh, for, through much of the season right there. I would argue that the Gulf would start collapsing. Their their wind shear typically it starts to collapse around I think like mid July or something like that. That's why for those of you in the deep south, we don't really have much severe weather going on in uh, in there for the, over the summer and, that, and it's mainly for you guys like if through October to May that's because the wind shear isn't going to be very favorable for severe weather but it's going to be very much more favorable for tropical weather that's where I'll tell you that about that but yeah I would say August that's when hurricanes could start organizing and developing in the crib in the western part of the Caribbean as well as the Gulf of Mexico this is typical stuff every year but I still think we could see more systems than what we had last year I mean every single uh, forecaster is calling for that it's calling for a very active season this year so we got to have to we got to pay very close attention to that here's what we have for September right here September is going to be pretty interesting, and at that point, I'm thinking we're going to have more Cape Verde setups, Cape Verde hurricane setups that mo- kind of move to the west and maybe possibly impact the Lesser Antilles right there as we continue to move th- uh, through it right there, as well as pretty much the Greater Antilles as well. So pretty much September, I would argue, is going to be kind of an all-around kind of threat where you could see hurricanes from the uh, develop from the gyre in Central America. You could see hurricanes develop over the Cape Verde uh, as well. You could see hurricanes develop pretty much anywhere at that point because you're going to see a lot weaker wind shear and you're going to see a lot less stuff. So here's what we have right here, the shear anomalies. Right, here. Uh, Unfortunately, CANSIPS can't do, uh, can't do shear anomalies. Uh, I'm, I really wish it did, but... Yeah, here's the NMME. They don't really do that either, but I'm taking a look at the SST's uh, uh, averages. We're still looking at around two or uh, two degrees Celsius above average. And considering where we were last year, I I personally think that this is these SSTs are going to outperform what we're going to be looking at from last year, and that's going to lead to more ocean heat content, and that's going to be a, allowing for a, a larger possibility for maybe a tropical storm that has the perfect conditions to rapidly intensify into a full blown hurricane and possibly impact uh, maybe in the Greater Antilles, maybe in the Gulf of Mexico. Pretty much anywhere is fair game by the time you get into August, and especially you get into September. So I will keep you updated here on the Pat's Path Predictor channel if I have any new information for you guys. Until then, be sure to check out my documentaries. I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in them, so I really hope you guys enjoy them. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and close the video out right here. I really hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel if you are new. It helps us out, helps us make more videos like these. The goal of this channel, as always, is to get more people engaged with weather. And with that being said, have a wonderful day, guys. Stay safe.